Jacob Ezra Katz, in a touch-and-go beginning, remained in an incubator in a Brooklyn hospital for several days after his birth on March 11, 1916. The third child in the Katz family, his passion for art began shortly after his feet outgrew his baby shoes. He scribbled on the linoleum floor until his crayons were worn to nubs, and then he ate them. His distraught mother couldn't figure out why he preferred them to her proffered oatmeal. As a five-year-old, one night he found an empty kitchen with a tempting pen and bottle of black India ink sitting on a white table. He covered the edges with drawings of houses, ships, planes, and people. His expectations of trouble when his mother discovered it the next morning disappeared when she pulled out their Sabbath tablecloth to preserve his art. Uncovering it to show visitors, she bragged, Ezra did this, until the picture smeared and faded. Young Ezra tried to figure out the ambivalence of his parents, their intense pride in his talent, coupled with an equally intense fear that he would become a starving artist. Polish Jews who had fled the pogroms, they had dreams of a better life for their children in America. Their worry fed his relationship with both of them. Art, illness, and that ambivalence recurred as themes of his childhood. At times, his mother helped him hide his after-school painting supplies as his father made his way up the stairs coming home from work. But Mr. Cat smelled the turpentine and began another lecture about starving artists. Go out and play like the other boys, he would say. Ezra hurried outside, where he unknowingly began storing up memories that would feed his art in years to come. Junior high brought two turning points in Ezra's life. Because of his absences with chronic sinus and stomach problems, he had to go to summer school. He met Martin Pope, who was there for an entirely different reason. Martin had sassed a teacher, and this was his punishment. The two boys bonded after classes over Mrs. Katz's ice-cold lemonade made with real lemons. The friendship was real, too. It would last a lifetime. The second change happened quite by accident. Ezra wandered far beyond his neighborhood one day and discovered a building with people going in and out. Curious, he followed them inside and found them reading newspapers and books. He learned he could check out some of those books for free and take them home to read. He shared his discovery with Martin and they began regular treks to the Arlington Branch Public Library. They parted at the reference section of the library where Martin read all of the science books and Ezra read all the art books. As they walked each other home, Ezra pointed out the variety of colors in the autumn leaves. Martin explained they had been there all the time until they lost their chlorophyll in the fall. The boys graduated from JHS 149 on February 3, 1932 and moved to Thomas Jefferson High School. Ezra became recognized as an artist as he made his way into high school. His prize-winning work was noted in the Jewish and general public newspapers as well as his school newspapers. When neighbors complimented his father on the awards, Ezra watched him shrug his shoulders and move on. But other times, Mr. Katz would bring him a tube of oil paint claiming a starving artist had traded it for a cup of coffee and a bowl of soup in the coffee shop where he worked. Mr. Katz decided if Ezra insisted on doing art, he should see fine art. He took Ezra to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and pointed out the Gilbert Stewart paintings of notable people. Ezra was unimpressed with the fancy clothes and stiff poses. He spied Daumier's painting, The Third Class Carriage, of Ordinary People, and went home determined to paint like Daumier. He talked his parents into posing for him, rejecting his father's notion that he would put on a coat and tie. The painting caused a family crisis when his mother showed it at a family gathering. His uncle castigated him for portraying his father as a failure. Ezra took offense and made a stand for the worth of ordinary people, and followed by announcing his intention of becoming an artist. After that, he seldom discussed his work with his family, but continued to rack up accolades in school and the community, including a first place award for his painting, Shantytown, in the National Scholastic Competition sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation. His work often featured people caught up in the Depression. High school graduation neared, and Ezra was scheduled to receive the art award. While he worried about having to make a public appearance to receive the award, a man knocked on the door and summoned him to come quickly. A policeman stood over his father's body and asked Ezra to remove the wallet and identify him. Ezra opened the wallet and found two $1 bills and a stack of newspaper clippings of his award that had obviously been unfolded and refolded many times. 
Ezra knew at that moment that his father's fear had been mingled with a great deal of pride. Mr. Katz's death meant Ezra could not accept the art scholarships he had been offered, but would have to go to work to help support his family. For a time, it appeared that his father's predictions of a starving artist would come true. When he could find them, Ezra worked at jobs related to his art until he became a fill-in artist for Marvel Comics. He and Martin, now a student at tuition-free City College, talked and walked each other home. Neighborhood children pointed, he draws Captain Marvel. Sometimes he saved a discarded drawing to give to them. World War II separated the two friends as Martin went to the Far East and Ezra to Tampa, Florida, where he created charts and booklets and painted pictures for posters for the Army. After the war, times were hard for Ezra. His sinus problems remained and his stomach problems escalated. His friends got married or moved away and signs on business doors read, No Jews Hired Here. Needing a job, he changed his name to Ezra Jack Keats, which sounded less Jewish. When Martin married Lily Bellin in a happy celebration, Ezra's stomach problems forced him to stick to milk and crackers instead of the wonderful foods at the reception. But he gained a new advocate. Lily Pope promoted and sold his art, sometimes rescuing a piece he had thrown into his wastebasket. Lacking direction for where his art career would lead, Ezra saved clippings for magazines that might serve as models, including one from a Life magazine that would spend 20 years rotating between his bulletin board and a drawer. When he became despondent, his brother loaned him money to spend a year in Paris studying art. After his return to the United States, he slowly began to get assignments for advertising, for works in magazines like Esquire, Playboy, and the New York Times and covers for the Reader's Digest and adult book jackets. One day by chance, Doubleday book editor Elizabeth Riley passed a window display showing one of those adult jackets just when she needed an artist for a young adult book she was editing. That led to more young adult jackets and then to illustrations and children's books. Working on these books, a couple of things bothered Ezra. He wanted to see something happening in a child's life in the story, and he wondered where the black children were. He saw them everywhere in real life, why weren't they in books? One night, as he walked home with friends, it began to snow. As he and his friends reminisced about their childhood snow activities, Ezra had an idea. I'm going to write a book and I'll dedicate it to you. In his studio, he pulled a Life magazine clipping from the drawer and put it on the bulletin board. The little African American boy in the clipping would become Peter. He painted and cut paper for collages. In the interest of economy, he sent his editor, Anna Stuff, a book alternating black and white pages with color. She sent it back to him saying all of the pages needed to be full color. Ezra was thrilled. The snowy day as the first full color picture book to feature a black child as the protagonist in a non-stereotypical fashion often brought the question of, why did he put a black child in the book? His answer was always the same, because he should have been there all along. A phone call a few months after publication left him bewildered. A very animated woman who said she was from the American Library Association told him he had won the Caldecott Award, but he had to keep it a secret until the press release. He sensed her excitement, but what was a Caldecott Award? He promised to keep the secret and thanked her on behalf of the little boy Peter. Checking later, his publishing friends told him this was the best award he could receive. Overcoming a fear of public speaking, he entranced the librarians at the award ceremony and posed proudly afterwards in this white dinner jacket with Madeline Lingle, who had won the Newbery for Wrinkle in Time. Ezra no longer had time to illustrate for other people. Peter and his other friends inhabited Ezra's studio. His memories of childhood adventures on Vermont Street mingled with his imagination as the children came to life in other books. Remembering his times with Martin, he gave Peter a friend named Archie. The bullies of his neighborhood showed up when Peter and Archie found a pair of goggles. Barney, who frightens Louie, resembles the Zodic, or holy man who had scared young Ezra. Ezra saw beauty in his old neighborhood and brought its scenes to his book. The dark tenement hallway in apartment three, the laundry waving in the breeze, and the diverse group of children who played together in the city streets. And when Peter became unhappy with his home life, he did exactly what an unhappy Ezra had done. He took Willie and ran away from home. As his books became beloved by children and librarians, 
Invitations came from across the United States for celebrating days or rooms named for him. Meeting the children was his favorite part of these trips. He not only talked to them, but really listened to what they had to say. Translation of his books into 16 languages preceded more invitations that brought international travel. He won other awards, including the medallion for his body of work given in 1980 by the University of Southern Mississippi at its annual Children's Book Festival. One of his greatest joys was a nostalgic return to the Arlington Branch Public Library that looked just the same, except now Peter, Archie, Amy, Willie, and their friends held a place of honor in the children's section. On his walks with Martin, Ezra looked ahead for new ways to get his stories into the hands of children, discussed his new health problems with his heart, and mentioned that he would like to create a foundation with the royalties from books that would do good. When Ezra died on May 6, 1983, Martin stood at the bedside holding his hand. He looked out at the city skyline silhouetted against the colorful sky, just as Ezra had painted in his books and thought, Ezra is walking me home. In the following years, the Pope family has nourished Keats's legacy by administering the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation. They have honored his request to do good. The foundation promotes his ideals of the common qualities of childhood, the importance of family, and the multicultural nature of the world. On its website, it also provides teachers with resources and children with activities related to his books. It gives many grants to public schools and libraries for programs that promote reading and support scholars who do research in children's literature. Of special importance on this occasion, it gives new writer and new illustrator and honor awards each year for books that demonstrate those ideals that Ezra Jack Keats believed were important to children. In this 100th anniversary year of his birth, it seems fitting for us to say happy birthday and thank you to Ezra. I get ideas from my books while walking along the street. Every artist puts the world he knows into his work. The world I have known, I share with you in my books.